Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, and I'm standing up because we have to do some show and tell, and my chair over here is otherwise occupied. I'm here to talk about the history of the mega box. <clears throat> you know what a mega box is. It's an entire artist's life or an entire composer's oeuvre, all stuffed into one box, taking up as little space as possible, which means, from the label's point of view, packaging it as inexpensively as possible, because, of course, they don't want to spend any more money than they have to, but they want to charge as much as they can get. So that's the idea. Now, the Mega Box is a uniquely digital phenomenon. It's a way station, in a way, along the continuum from major consumer product that takes up space in your life and digi thing that takes up virtually no physical space at all. Because as you know, digital recordings occupy the quantum realm somewhere. They're just little digi bits. And the only issue is what, you know, the storage capacity of whatever medium you're using. They can fit into virtually nothing, which means they can be sold at whatever price they can get. And it cost them virtually nothing, especially with recordings that the labels have already paid for. Because the labels today, record labels today, don't expect to make any money on classical recordings at all. The recordings are usually given to them. They're paid for. They're sponsored by something. And the major labels are simply distribution arms. You know, the print run has already been paid for. The, everything has been paid for. And they just distribute them, either digitally or as physical product, depending on how much money they've been given. But they're also sitting on these enormous archives of things, the cost of which has been fully amortized. They've all been paid for over the years, or they've written them off as the horrifying losses that they were. I mean, here's an example of one, which we will talk about shortly. We haven't done it yet, but if this is the year 5786, we have done it. It's the Free Choy Box. This is the second Free Choy Box box series thing. But there it is, 88 CDs, the guy's entire life on disc in this handy dandy, very convenient and portable little, little, little format here. And technically, if you wanted to, I mean, look, you can carry it upside down, you can do it this way, you can use it as a doorstop. There was a time when 88 of anything, <laughs> of the things in here, would take up a phenomenal amount of space. <clears throat> so let us briefly recapitulate. In the beginning, Boratius, there was 78s. There were 78s. Well, there were wax cylinders, but there were 78s. They were large, heavy, clunky, shellac discs, about like yay big around and yay thick. They were very brittle. They broke very easily. They sounded like crap. You could only fit four minutes on a side. They whizzed around at 78 revolutions per minute. And they were sold because if anything was longer than four minutes, you need many of them in these large gatefold wooden and, and, and cloth bound volumes, which took up enormous amounts of space and weighed a ton. They were really pieces of furniture and they were luxury items. They were expensive. Then in the 1950s came the LP, which stands for long play or long playing. These went slower. They whizzed around at 33 and a third RPMs. They, they were round things like this, made out of more durable plastic. And that was the birth of the record industry, really, long playing. I mean, because they became a consumer commodity. They were less expensive. They were, they were more easily stored, even though they weighed a lot. And they took up, you know, shelf space like this, but they were thin, so you could put a lot of them in there. You know, like you see CDs here. They're actually about the thickness of almost half a CD box here. You know, there's a little CD, single CD thing. You get like two LPs in that space. But they were much taller. They came all the way up to there. You know, so that was, that was an issue with them. But the more important point was that they were marketed and sold as real consumer products. You know, we, 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 we lament the, the dearth of information that comes with these mega boxes or with CDs because you get occasionally tiny, tiny booklets. And in big boxes, if they're vocal works, you don't get booklets at all that have the text and translations. And you, you used to get those things. This was not... A, a 
revolution in the marketing of classical music at all. This was normal consumer sensibility. I mean, here, for example, is a box of Hamburger Helper. This box of Hamburger Helper has directions on the back. Look, cook, stir, simmer, heat, simmer, add into cheesy sauce. Stir in the chopped cooked bacon, shredded cheese, and chopped fresh tomatoes before serving. And you get here the ingredients right there. So what, what is the equivalent of that in classical music terms? Well, the equivalent in classical music terms of the ingredients was the performers, who's doing it, what the disc contains, what it is, and then you had the notes, which were the instructions on the back of the box. They were the things that told you something about what the music was, who wrote it, when he wrote it, why he wrote it, what it was. Now, of course, the instructions on a classical recording were somewhat more scholarly or involved than what you get on the back of a box of Hamburger Helper, although not more scientific because the instructions here were tested in their labs over and over again. It's very scientific and very carefully worded so that even a complete blithering idiot could understand how to make a Hamburger Helper. And the same thing was true of classical, good classical notes. Not that you're blithering idiots, but that it was supposed to be written in a way that normal people could understand and that would entice them to purchase the product. Now the labels don't care because that costs money. It costs money to have booklets and hire people to write them and publish them and insert them and do all the things you needed to do. Whereas when you have this thing, <clears throat> Here, um, it costs virtually nothing. You just make the discs. Oh, if you can get it off. Oh, God. Oh, it's coming. If you can open it at all. Yes, there we go. There they are. You just shove them in there any which way. They did make a booklet. There's a little booklet here. Here's the bookie that's the same size. And you shove that in there, too. But people don't get to see what's in the booklet until they buy this thing. You see, the beauty of the LP was that the packaging was designed so that the instructions, the thing that might lure you in to purchase it, was available on the back. You just look, took a look at the album, you could read the notes, most of the time anyway, and you would know what you're getting. That was a wonderful thing about it. That wasn't true of multi-disc sets, of boxes. And this, and this is the, the, the issue with boxes generally, which is the more boxy it is, the less obvious the information they can put on the back because there's more stuff there and you only have limited real estate to show off the information. So boxes are inherently less communicative as, as items to the consumer than the basic LP design, which was a brilliant design when you think about it. I mean, we learned so much from reading the backs of those LPs by the intelligent people who wrote the notes, at least most of the time. So there you go. Now, on the way to said mega box, there were some way, station, way stations, and it's the historical way stations that interest us. So here, now this is like way station number one. See this thing here? This is DG's CD Beethoven edition from like, I don't know, the 70s or something. It has this very nice book, hardcover book, a lovely hardcover book. What was the year that this came out? Let me see if they actually tell us. I mean, they usually will at some point. Oh, uh, we're happy, we're thrilled, we're delighted. Yes, we know how delighted they are. Um, suggestions for further reading. I mean, it's a nice essay. You can handle the book quite well. And, oh, here we are, illustrations. Oh, come on, give me a date, be nice to me. Well, there's no date on here. Uh, that would be far too logical. All right, but there will be dates in here because what you got here was a series of boxes, a series of boxes, just like the old DG Complete Beethoven LP edition that came out in 1977. Um, they were a series of volumes with their own booklets as well as the larger thing here. This is in celebration of the 100th anniversary, of its 100th anniversary, DG, it's 20 volumes, 87. Okay, so it's DG's 100th anniversary. And DG's 100th anniversary occurred in, well, it was got, it had to be like around 2005 or something like that. It was somewhere in there. Um, let's see, here we have, oh, here we go, I see dates. Oh, these are recording dates, booklet. Let's see, it printed by DG, oh, I give up. I absolutely give up, but it had to be like the early 2000s. 
somewhere in 1997, somewhere in there, around the turn of the century, because record, it's how old recordings are, so I'm not worrying about it so much. So when Gigi was 100, they issued this. But the concept behind this packaging is that of LP album packaging. You will note, because it's in separate sections, with, in a, they put them in a, in, a, in a plastic thingy here, and the plastic thingy has spaces between these things because they don't exactly fit. It was a custom job, in other words. It had to be a custom job. They had no choice. And so this was a, a, an LP-style bit of packaging and marketing for the CD era. That's what we're looking at. And so this goes... Wait, is it time? Over here. Let's just get out of the way. So that was the beginning of the era of the mega box or mega collection. But the mega box, it's a custom box for an entire oeuvre, only came a little bit later. And I think the date here, or well, relevant date, was around 2000 and something, around 2005. Because here we have the first, I think, or one of the first of the mega boxes. There it is. Hi, I'm down here. The original Rube, complete Rubenstein edition on RCA. Now look at this mother. I was going to get my bathroom scale out here to weigh it. This thing weighs a ton. I mean, you have to schlep it through your house like this. It helps to have a, a, you know, a dolly or something to carry it on or a hand truck. This is amazing. It has, well, everything he did. And you've got, you see it opens like this. Uh -huh. See how it opens? And then you've got these, these, these custom albums, one at a time. Here they are. Beautiful, beautiful albums with the, the disc in, in this, this, this sort of sleeve thing with individual notes for each recording, each one. It's beautiful. And they, they fit in this gatefold thing. I think it's, it's made of concrete. I mean, it must have been. And it came with this enormous booklet. Here's the book. It's not a booklet, it's a book that has everything categorized a million different ways. And it says here, very interesting, packaging for the 82 volumes, 82 volumes, developed and manufactured by Advanced Loose Leaf Technologies in Dighton, Massachusetts. And it says the Arthur Rubenstein Collection box is handmade by Dickard Witter Industries in Maspeth, New York. Now, I remember when this came out. I remember vividly when this came out. 1999, here's the year, yeah. It was a big issue because, because RCA had no ability in its warehouses to store the thing. It was impossible. It was, it was such an odd configuration, such an odd size, an odd weight. It wound up, ultimately, this was a, something of a failure, I was told by the RCA PR person lady, um, and they wound up virtually giving them away because they were stuck with quantities of them that they didn't know what to do with. Stores couldn't store them, people couldn't, people couldn't carry them. I mean, it was really quite something. But this was, I think, the first... Well, listen now, there you go, listen to how solid that is, huh? This was the first of the major artist, there it is, let's do a little bit there, late major artist mega boxes. <laughs> after that, after this thing, um, the labels figured out that because mega boxes were going to be a thing, they had to figure out a way to package them more cheaply because this was still the LP style in a way. You got book, booklets for every single disc, beautiful notes, a big giant jumbo, jumbo middle, middle indexy type booklet thing. You had all of that stuff. They couldn't afford to make all of that stuff and supply it with these mega boxes. And this, this too, this is a piece of furniture. Where are you going to put it? I have it on top of a bookcase. It really is extraordinary. And so, and so we see that these way stations here, the PG thing and the RCA thing, had to give way to something cheaper, especially cheaper, above all, cheaper and simpler for the packaging and presentation of this music. And the result was the standard mega box. And the mega boxes come in two forms. They come in, as you saw, this form, like this, or 
alternately in a large square square box like thing um, arranged you know either in columns or in DG's ever so charming swastika style of formatting of the discs inside but they have uh, that's what it is now it's become a standard thing and the box can sometimes have a beautiful booklet more often than not you will get no texts and translations minimal notes the idea is to give you the most charge you the most that they can but of course have it cost the least and that is the final step for the ultimate digitization of all of this material where you get absolutely nothing for the entire box other than the music itself and the problem the problem i see in this isn't that it's i mean it's wonderful value it's fabulous to be able to get all this stuff it should all be available but the problem is that is that the industry has given up given up normal marketing the hamburger helper approach to selling classical music which by the way is the right way it's the right way to sell anything it's not rocket science you tell people what they're buying you thank them for their purchase you give them some basic instructions and you you lure them in you design the product to attract people to let them feel like you know they're getting something good for their money I mean, all of that is gone. Now, the only, only object or objective that these labels have, I can sit on this or lay on it, is to issue as much stuff as possible, as cheaply as possible, as minimally as possible. And that, my friends, is where we are today. So keep on listening. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.